Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is someone our longtime listeners know very well. He is Anthony Anarino. Anthony is the author of the sales blog, which I believe is the longest running blog of its kind, as well as the books Eat Their Lunch, Winning Customers Away from Your Competition, The Lost Art of Closing, and The Only Sales Guide You'll Ever Need. He's the host of In the Arena, a podcast that explores the methods and practices of performance leaders and thinkers. He's an entrepreneur, a results coach and consultant, and an internationally renowned speaker who's been on the Break It Down show several times. We are proud to call him our friend and happy to absorb all that he so generously bestows on us, which you can all get by subscribing to the salesblog.com. And if you don't already love him, you will. Here's our guest, Anthony Anarino. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Anthony Anarino, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, we are proud and pleased once again to have Anthony Anarino back on the show. He is a uh, best-selling author, an internationally recognized speaker on sales and success. And one of the things that I really like about you, Anthony, is that you approach sales from a solution standpoint um, and make it really the noble profession that it is uh, so that we not only as salesperson can persons can ring up sales, so to speak, but we can create solutions for our customers that create long-term relationships. Uh, I've always enjoyed that about your content. Uh, he is the author of thesalesblog.com, and if you guys aren't subscribed to it and you have not only a profession that has to do with sales, but a profession that has to do with service, uh, or if any measure of your success has to do with customer satisfaction, you should subscribe and uh, consume the content of the sales blog. Now that I've said all that stuff, uh, Anthony, you have several books out and everybody can find all those books on Amazon. You're, you're really easy to find. Um, what are you working on lately? More books, uh, three more books. I've, I've, st- I'm going to go ahead and mute for a second. We're going to have to just cut this. I'm sorry. Somebody knocked <laughs> on the door. That's all right. And all hell has broken loose in my home. <laughs> or we can just talk through it right now and just uh, we'll leave it there for people to enjoy. Yeah. Let's do I that. have uh, I have two uh, small pit Maltese, very, very dangerous, you know, little fluffy white breed, as you can hear, threatening whoever's knocking on our door. Yeah. It sounds like uh, very threatening cotton balls. Absolutely. The. The thing that I'm working on right now is more books, and I've I've had a plan to write a book a year. So I, I started with The Only Sales Guide You'll Ever Need, the most unfortunate first title for a guy with a three-book deal. I followed that up with The Law Start of Closing, and then um, late last year in November, I released Eat Their Lunch, a book about how you take customers away from your competition, since that's what most people do. And I've turned my attention, I've done a lot of writing, and I'm compiling all this writing and the ideas to write the next three books. But I took a year off just to be fair to the three books that I've already written. And, you know, when you write three books, you need to market those books and sell those books and get them into people's hands. And I wanted to be fair to the books instead of just going year after year after year. I thought, I'll give it a pause year. Let me really find out what it is that I want to write about next and then go ahead and do that. So the next three books, one is going to be about coaching. Uh, particularly for managers and leaders. Uh, The one after that will be around productivity, where I spend a lot of time thinking and writing and building processes that help other people. And then the final one will be about negativity. It won't be the final one. It'll be the the third of three. So the first book, you're centered on the idea of uh, coaching for sales leaders. It'll probably go a little broader than that. I mean, what the, the coaching framework that I use is applicable to anybody, but the book may focus on sales just because that audience is there for me. Okay. I imagine that you get a lot of that audience in the speaking that you do and that the sales leaders really gravitate to you because their job is not only to be um, good 
salespeople, good closers, good solution finders, but also to inspire other people to increase their performance. And that's typically the people that you meet uh, when you're out on the road. Is that true? Yeah. You know, the, the manager's got the toughest role. It's easy to be an individual contributor because you can control your own actions. But then when you have a team of, say, eight or 10 people, and they all have different needs, they all have a different level of skills, they all have the different experiences, and you're trying to align those resources to produce the very best outcome, you've got to be a good leader. And a good leader generally ends up being a really good coach. And a coach is somebody that can help you you know, find the best version of yourself, who can help you understand your blind spots and do something about them. I, I don't think in my world we spend enough time on that. So I'll give you just one sort of idea. There's a lot more people that get an investment in training at the sales role than there are people who get an investment of training and development at a manager or leadership role. It's sort of assumed if you're in that role, you know how to do your job and you you should be doing it. But the truth of the matter is those people need as much or as more development as their team does. So if somebody's formally trained, let's say you get an MBA, there's a, there are a lot of MBA programs out there that have a leadership component in their focus. And if you're that guy, you know, you get a great education, let's say. And then after that, you're out on your own. And I think you're right. There are a lot of folks out there who, who focus on uh, the development of a salesperson but even those who are educated, and I, I'll, I'll ask you, what percentage of the sales leadership population out there uh, has a formal education in sales leadership? Um, almost none. Wow. But it's even it's even worse than that because when you when you think about um, how do you learn how to do anything, and the 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 way that you learn to swim is by getting in the water and swimming, and you can read a book. But reading a book about swimming isn't going to teach you to swim, and you're going to put yourself in a dangerous situation if you get into the deep end uh, without knowing how to swim. And uh, sometimes that's how we learn. But if you're studying and reading while you're doing something and you're engaged in some endeavor, then you can start to make distinctions about what you see and how to interpret it and what kind of choices are available to you. And uh, because that's true, I think that, you know, it's I, it's never a bad idea to get an education. An MBA would be great. Going through sales leadership training, that's a really, really important thing to do. But you have to be doing the work at the same time. You have to be able to have some place where you can go and do that work so you get the immediate feedback and you can start making adjustments. You've talked about, and I totally agree with you on this, and by the way, I use your swimming example all the time with podcast clients, so uh, know that I'm out there ringing your bell for you. Also, and you know, let me say this too before I lose track of this, whenever I'm advising clients on how to host a show, because as you know with your own podcast in the arena, you know, it's not just asking questions. There's a lot more going on. There are subtleties. You're, there's prep involved. You're making different decisions. And, and actually, you know, as John and I host this thing, I want to get us away from the sales part and talk. Let's just transition with this idea of M an MFA over an MBA now at this point. Like, it's one thing mm -hmm. to be focused on sales all the time, but you're not defined by the sales process. So let's get into what's interesting to you, and let's let's start with, talking about this concept of giving a master of fine arts instead of a business administration? You know, most of what we do, and I, I love that question, mo most of what we do when we're trying to create new and better results is a creative endeavor. I mean, we're trying to look at something and say, what are our options? What are our choices? How could we find a better result here? And if you're constrained by only the things that you know, and you're not opening yourself up to possibilities, then there is no innovation. And the reason I think that um, business people would do much better to get an MFA and a, a whole bunch of reasons. One, uh, you have to think very, very laterally. So you have to start looking at things. And um, Pete, you and I know each other through uh, a John Boyd group, you know, and, right. and there was always the John Boyd story where, you know, he would tell people that they have these things like you have a lawnmower, you have skis, you know, and, and you're supposed to make something out of it. And when it's done, if you are with a group of smart enough people to figure it out, it's a snowmobile or it's a whole bunch of disparate pieces that have no relationship to each other. 
But right. art is the kind of endeavor that causes you to look at things through this different lens to say, what could I do with these parts? What could I create that's novel? How do I create something that allows us to get a result that we can't get right now out of things that I might not be able to see if I look through it traditionally? And I think that's the value of a of, uh, master of fine art sort of approach. Like you have to think broadly, much more broadly than we do. You know, having been to Harvard Business School and going through their executive education, a lot of traditional finance and a lot of traditional concepts, but novelty is really important as well. And I think when you start to look at it that way and you start looking at, you know, in my view, what Silicon Valley is missing most of all is they have the disruption part, but they don't have the humanities part. They don't have the, the art part. It's just disrupt and replace. And that's not really how things have evolved, you know, through human intervention over time. Things have evolved by generally, uh, transcending and including the thing that came before it. I mean, so basically we're just adding novelty to certain things. Business people would do really, really well to start thinking that way. That's really interesting because Silicon Valley is, well, you know, everybody knows about the success of Apple having been, uh, you know, ha having had a component that was crucial to it that was visual and, uh, tactile to a certain degree, but there was a user experience that was missing in all of the other technologies and the way that they applied whatever they were doing that Apple got right. And it would seem like everybody would take the example that, hey, there is an experience and we have to get to the human emotional part. And that should translate into the way that we do business, not just in the products we sell. You haven't seen that to be the case, though. You know, in the shopping mall that's down the street from my house, which I frequent uh, regularly, not because I ever want to go to a shopping mall, but because the bookstore is connected to it. And I do like to go to bookstores. The Apple store in that particular location um, is never empty. It's never empty until it closes. It's full of people from the time it opens till the time it closes, which tells you something about the value of the aesthetic or the value of how they make things easy to do and what they believe that they're creating. And they think they're creating tools for human beings to do things that otherwise they couldn't do. And I, I think that's true. And I, I think you're right. More people should pay attention to those things because the, all those intangibles end up making Apple, Apple, and also make them one of the, you know, what two or three largest companies in the world. Pete uh, was bringing up that one of the tenets in Silicon Valley business is to fail fast. I'm curious as to whether or not they use the business tenants when it comes to operating a sales organization. Do they also do things adventurously and disrupt the way that they find solutions, address customer issues, and bring sales solutions to the fore? And are they? do you see that technology companies in particular are using those, those properties, the, the ability to fail fast and then be nimble? Uh, and, and turn around and create a different kind of solution? Or are people for some reason uh, stuck and mired in old ways in some of the way that they do business as opposed to, you know, things like product development? I, I would think in that regard, they're regressive. I mean, I think they've gone backwards. And the, wow. the thing that I would tell you that I see most of all there is this idea of uh, Taylorism, the idea that you're going to slice the role of sales so thin that you have one person who qualifies the prospective client, another person who gives them a demo, another person who takes over the account to close them, and another person to be a customer success manager. And it's just sliced so thin. It looks like going back to the beginning of the industrial age, you know, when one person turns this screw, another person turns that one, and we're doing sort of an assembly line. And I don't think it's as effective as other choices. But in, in this regard, they're in exact opposition to what they do and say product development. Oddly enough, that seems to be the truth. That is pretty odd. Uh, I think, you know, the way that we are advancing in a lot of the ways that we think and do and do business and run operations, it's funny to think that we're going backwards. But as you describe those processes, you know, I think about the last few times that I made a, a purchase, uh, you know, on behalf of my business 
where I had to go through that traditional B2B sales process of having a, you know, lead generator and then a qualifier and then the presentation person and then the closer who offered the, you know, variety of levels of purchase. And it does, it feels like you're being quote unquote sold in, in the negative connotations. Yeah. Do you think that there is a hope for businesses out there to turn these processes around and show a new generation of, of solution finders on behalf of their customers? Because I don't like to use the word salespeople, except you know when I'm with someone like you who is in the know about what sales is. Uh, because, you know, we've been, Pete and I both in our variety of roles across many different industries have had a sales role in the context that we have customers who have a problem. And there are problems that involve us stepping in and creating a solution and charging the customer some money. And hopefully it's enough money that we are able to come back and do business the next day. And if we're doing it right, they say, we want you to come back every day. And so from that context, I just want to explain for our listener that that's sales. It's not tricking somebody into purchasing something and coming up off of some money that they probably shouldn't have spent otherwise. Along those lines, are there, are there organizations out there that you see that are leading the way? And, and can, would you be willing to talk about some of those organizations and kind of point them out, call them out for doing right? Most of most of the people I know are what now are just traditional consultative salespeople. It's it's interesting to me how much the negative connotation around the word sales or salesperson persists for so long. And uh, I wrote about this in my second book. But when I was teaching a personal selling class at Capital University, where I went to college, I would always start the class by asking the students to give me all of the words that they would use to describe salespeople. And they came up with pushy, selfish, self-oriented, smarmy, you know, manipulative. And I would wait until we had a really full whiteboard of negative words. And then I would ask them to raise their hand if their mom or dad worked in sales. And about six hands out of 25 might go up. And then I would ask them to put their hands down if their mom was in sales or keep their hands up if their mom was in sales, rather. And there would be three or so people left with their hands up whose mom worked in sales. And then I would say, so you would describe your mom as pushy, selfish, self-oriented, manipulative, slimy. And they would start laughing because they were talking about their mom. And they would say, my mom is nothing like that. My mom is a wonderful person. Her clients love her. She takes great care of them. And, And then I asked them, why does this connotation persist? And it it persists specifically because of movies like Glengarry Glenn Ross or interactions with poorly trained car salespeople, which is most people's first experience buying anything of any real relevance. And when that doesn't go well, they think that that's what all salespeople are like. But generally, that's the anomaly. I mean, that's the rarity for anybody to be selfish or pushy. Almost no salesperson on earth knows how to do a hard sell or a hard close anymore because it hasn't been useful for maybe, I don't know, let's call it two decades. Two decades, it hasn't been useful. So they don't even know how to do it. But the the connotation is really, really sticky and persistent, and it hasn't changed. And are there, let's say, 5 to 10% of salespeople who really are horrible salespeople and selfish and self-oriented and manipulative? Sure. But I would say that 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 population is no greater than the pushy, smarmy, manipulative unethical lawyers or doctors or accountants or grocery store owners or whatever population it is you want to choose. Um, Most people are truly consultative and are trying to do good work. And I would say they're probably softer than ever because no one wants to be that salesperson. I think in the role of a coach, uh, there's an evolution that needs to happen in that direction as well. And there's a lot of evolution that has happened in that direction as well, because I was going to start to imply that there's a shift in sales approach that you're pointing out. And I'm waiting for a shift in leadership approach. But, you know, now that I think back on it, I've had some really good leaders in my life. So I appreciate that 
Are you seeing that kind of a shift or have you seen a great shift in leadership that is more uh, consultative and uh, more nurturing and, and more individual? I think it depends on what people were exposed to. And I, I think that most of us are more like the Fair leader. Enough. Most of us are like the leader that we had and, and, and we model that. So I think if you had a really good leader, you probably try to model that really good leader. But if you've never had a good leader, and I would say that's probably a common experience for people, then you don't really know what to do. And so in, in the world that I live in, I live in the world of sales. Yeah, if your leader only cared about activity and all they did was push you for more activity because that's what they knew how to do, then that's probably the kind of leader that you're going to be you're because that's your model of what success looks like. But if you had a leader that coached and spent time with you and helped you find the better version of yourself and expected it of you, and um, you can remember the great leaders you had. They weren't the ones that allowed you to be mediocre. I mean, it was clear that they were pushing you, but they weren't doing it because you were a means to an end. You were the end. They were actually trying to improve you because they saw something in you that you didn't see in yourself. And they forced you, and I'm using force uh, as an as a intentional choice because force is uh, what bad leaders do. They go to force, but they did force you through influence and character and example and inspiration to reach down deep inside yourself and find another gear and then do better work. But I think if you had that experience, then you know what you should probably be thinking about as a leader because that's really your goal. Your goal is to grow people so they produce the best result that they're capable of. Still too rare. For the leaders in sales at the very top who are doing the big ticket items for, you know, they're selling solutions that are moving industries. Are the tools different? And if they are, what tools are there uh, out there that, that are different that a person who strives to that level of transaction uh, can, can access? I don't think that the tools are any different. I mean, I, I think that there, if you want to look at how best to move you and your organization to the future, you don't look to the future, you look to the past. And integrity, having a vision of what the future should look like, caring about other people, the people that are in your charge, organizing people in a way that allows you to get the best out of them, communicating that vision continuously to a, a group of people, encouraging people and helping them find the better version of themselves and allowing them the freedom and empowering them to explore what their choices are. All of those things have been necessary since the beginning of time and will always be necessary in the future. That isn't going to change. So I think that the, the scale of it means as a, a leader over a much bigger organization, you have to have really strong leaders underneath you. So if you I uh, want to go to a military analogy of really strong four stars, got a lot of really strong two stars and a lot of really strong kernels because that's what the scale requires. And everybody's on the same page. And I'm I'm more and more interested in ideas like mission command you know, from the military. And, and Pete definitely knows what that means. And uh, Don Vandergriff, who's a part of a group that we met through, has done a remarkable amount of work on how you lead that way by giving people the mission and helping encourage them to find a way to complete that mission on their own without you having to tell them how to do every single thing. And we talk about empowerment, but we, we don't always enable the empowerment because as an organization gets bigger, we start putting rules and regulations around things and we become more bureaucratic and that bureaucracy starts to stifle that kind of initiative. So that those things have always been true. They'll always be true. Character, integrity, vision, empowerment, and the ability to do it at scale is really the art of leadership at the highest level. Well, empowerment implies, and it not only implies, sometimes it absolutely requires that a leader relinquish some degree of power. And not everybody's comfortable that way. So as a leader of leaders, how do we, how do you make people comfortable? How do you make me comfortable saying, hey, listen, turn away. Don't worry about the details about how this guy does his work. Inspire him to do his best work and then let it go. Is that, is that, am I interpreting your message correctly? 
No, I don't, I don't, I don't think it means ignore it and hope for the best. I think it means uh, accountability and uh, giving people the coaching they need and allowing them to fail, but not to fail on things that are important for them not to fail on and giving them more feedback and coaching them along the way. I think accountability is a critical component. And I don't think that saying, I'm just going to trust people to do whatever they want is really good guidance. I mean, you should have best practices. We know that there are some things that work that need to be executed consistently in order to produce results. You just can't give up on that stuff. But th there's a balance, right? And there's always a balance. How much freedom do I give somebody? Well, it depends. How much experience do they have? How much uh, situational knowledge or awareness do they have? Do they understand what their choices are? Do they know how to make that good decision? And if they don't know how to make the good decision, do they know where to go to get help? Okay, so we, we have a continuum there. There's a spectrum. Some people don't have the experience or the knowledge to make those decisions, so you give them more. Give them more direction. You give them more boundaries, more guidelines, and let them work inside those barriers that you put on both sides of them to prevent something bad from happening. But the longer that they do this work and the more that they understand what decisions they should make and what their choices are, then the more freedom you're going to give them because their experience says they can make those good decisions. And uh, that, again, is just the art of leadership, sales or otherwise. Okay. Well, you know, we've talked so far a lot about sales and, uh, and a bit about leadership as well. I want to push away from those topics because everybody should subscribe to the sales blog, uh, read all the content that's there. You have a ton of books that – provide a lot of thought and a lot of guidance on sales and sales leadership and everybody please go cons do yourself a favor and go consume all of this stuff uh he is An anthony anarino and uh and he's easy to find uh check out the sales blog now i want to explore anthony anarino though and what you're looking at because you generate so much content and it's not like you're regurgitating the same stuff over and over again you continue to break new ground. You continue to push into a variety of different kinds of thought about how to execute. And so I have to wonder, the guy who's great at shooting free throws is doing something else to tune up the muscles that allow for the endurance of free throw shooting. What are you, what are you exploring outside of what you write that allows you the mind space to come up with the stuff that you're writing and keep it fresh and keep it different and keep it evolving. What are you looking at? I, I tend to um, not read so much about business anymore. And behind me on the shelves that I have, I have maybe, I don't know, I have hundreds and hundreds of business books and I've read hundreds and hundreds of business books over years and they've all been helpful in some way, but I tend to uh, move away from that kind of content. And I'm, I'm more interested in psychology. I'm more interested in philosophy. I'm more interested in creativity and the, the more human things that we do. Those tend to be more interesting to me. So I tend to uh, study things like integral theory, which is a concept from Ken Wilber that I incorporated into the third book in a chapter on discovery that ends up being sort of a speed bump in the book because the concept is so big and it's essentially how humans developed over time. And I, I'm interested in things like um, Robert Keegan's work at Harvard and Keegan's written uh, a number of books about change. Uh, one of them, a very good one called Immunity to Change uh, about how human beings develop and how we go through the process of changing our long held beliefs and accepting that there's new choices available to us. I still read a lot of history and a lot of military history because I find the lessons there so useful because the consequences are always so great. So I tend to, to move out from business to other concepts where you can see connections between things that allow you to have something more interesting to talk about. I'm uh, fascinated right now with a number of people, including uh, Jordan Peterson, who's, uh, I would call him a Jungian guy, but that's not going far enough. His book, 12 Rules for Life and Antidote to Chaos is a, a really interesting piece of work. And he's a lightning rod uh, for a whole bunch of people because he's a free thinker. And I'm, I'm more interested in that. And from a podcasting standpoint, Joe Rogan brings on the most eclectic group of people from 
you know, uh, Dom D'Agostino, who will talk about uh, the ketogenic diet too. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. You know, uh, Dom D'Agostino, who will talk about uh, the ketogenic diet to uh, Brian Cox, an astrophysicist who will explain to you how we know that the Big Bang happened 13.8 billion years ago and what a black hole is. And so th- those are the kinds of things that I think are, are more interesting to explore. And again, back to our, our earlier conversation about lateral thinking, that's where ideas start to come together and you start to see different patterns. And I think that's a really useful thing for human beings to do is to just, and I've written this probably a dozen times on the blog, just read widely. I mean, pick up things that just interest you, not because you think, well, I know what I'm going to get out of this. When you pick up one of my books, it's a sales book. You know what you're going to get out of it. You're going to get tactics and strategies that I made practical and tactical. But if you pick up a book from somebody like Brian Cox, or you, you pick up something you know, a science related book, you're going to see things that you wouldn't see. And it also makes you a lot more conversational, a lot more interesting. So it sounds like big ideas uh, are important to you. And, and I don't just mean that in the sense that there are big business ideas, but ideas about philosophy and ideas that, that, that tell us why we know certain things are true. I mean, I'm a Rogan listener as well, and I listen to all of the stuff. And there's no, of course, there are certain comedians I really love, and I'll gravitate towards those episodes, but I always get around to the lesser known folks who are on the show because they're fascinating for one reason or another. And I agree with you that those things kind of open up parts of your mind that could stimulate finding a different solution uh, or you know, just a different form of thought than you're used to that spurs something else into action one day uh, when you wake up. In finding those things for yourself, how how do you keep your mind in tune so that you so that you're available for that kind of input? Is there anything that you're doing in terms of you know, like, are there any practical meditation things that you're doing to keep your mind open or what kind of you know push-ups for the brain are you doing? And I, I certainly meditate. That's something that I'm uh, I've been doing for maybe seven years consistently, and I I think that that does help. But I, I'll tell you, uh, the thing that probably helps me the most is that uh, right now the entire American populace is infected with the idea that we should be offended by things that we disagree with. And that if somebody says something that I don't like, I should be offended and I've in some way been harmed. Well, I think that's exactly the wrong way to look at things. I tend to look at the ideas that I don't like. I tend to want to look at the things that I don't see the value in, but that other people find tremendously valuable to find the truth in that. And the the way that I think of this is something in, in part that I learned from Ken Wilber, or at least something that helped activate it, is the idea that no one has... Uh, Uh, a monopoly on the truth. And also no one is capable of a hundred percent error. No one's capable of being wrong a hundred percent of the time. That's too hard of a thing to be able to do. Although I have known some people that I felt like were trying very hard to be wrong about everything. But the, (laughs) the, the truth of the matter is uh, if you're not open to looking at things that cause you discomfort, then you're never going to grow. And the way that you know, if you're going to grow and if you're open to grow is your willingness to say, I've changed my mind about this. And if you haven't changed your mind about something in the, in the last couple of years, then you're not growing. If you haven't decided that what you believed wasn't the best uh, version of the truth or that it was not an incomplete version of the truth, then you really can't grow. So you have to be willing to look at things that you don't agree with and that you don't like. And you have to be willing to explore ideas, even the ideas that you don't like at all. So the, the things that I like, um, 
that that helped me do that. I'll give you a couple examples. Russell Brand is a very interesting and a very funny guy who has a very, very strong socialist, anti-capitalist uh, ideas and uh, espoused with great vigor and, and with a great commitment. And he tends to bring on people that don't share his views. And it's interesting to listen to that because there's a conflict there with which most of us believe to be true and what he believes to be true. And he's having this conversation with some people who have some shared uh, agreements with him about things and others that have strong disagreements. And the ability and the willingness to have a conversation with someone who you disagree with and still be polite and still be engaging and still be entertaining and not think that the other person is Hitler uh, is a really, really powerful stance to be able to take. And, and when you watch Joe Rogan, it's the same thing. There's people there that have ideas that I despise the idea, but I'm going to listen to it because there's some truth there that might be worth looking at as you try to figure out what what truth really is for you and, and how you believe and how you behave in this world. So that, that's what I do. I tend not to judge the idea. I tend to observe and see if I can find some value in what other people say. If you can do that, you open yourself up to a whole different world. I'm not sure how to punctuate that as uh, emphatically as I feel it. Exclamation mark. Two exclamation marks. Yeah, two exclamation marks. Maybe underline a couple things too. But man, I agree with you so wholeheartedly that we have to explore those ideas. The problem that I uh, have is never with somebody whose idea is different. The problem that I have is typically getting through uh, the horseshit, pardon my French, that a lot of people espouse when they're in the middle of trying to convince you of their idea. And yeah. there's a ton of that, but I, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to piggyback on your point by saying, hey, as we evolve toward the better sharing of conflicting ideas – and man, you bring up a couple of powerhouses when it comes to, you know, Russell Brand is not an easy guy to argue with because he talks fast and everything that he says is packed with something. You know, he's not just mumbling gibberish all the time and the speed at which he puts his ideas forth with, like you said, great vigor. Um, that's, that's tough to debate, but he does give people a chance. Jordan Peterson, I love him. He gives people a chance, but he also doesn't take any smack. I would say Chris Cuomo uh, is probably my favorite guy to watch on the news for exactly that reason, because he brings on the conflicting opinion. And while he does have a viewpoint and share his viewpoint, he gives time and he gives courtesy to somebody who has a different viewpoint. And if we all can learn that, whether it's a viewpoint about, you know, whether it's politics or economics or just ideas about how to address business and, and service, uh, I think that's great. I also want to quote a guy I've been reading and listening to a lot named Stephen Rinella. He's a hunter and a writer and not necessarily in that order, I believe. He's, he's you know, become known for a TV show he had called Meat Eater. And for the books that he's written about hunting, but it's his writing that I'm really attracted to. And one of the things that he's said is that, you know, when he talks about people he really admires and what he thinks people admire about him being a hunter is that they all involve, and I'll quote, people who get real fucking good at being goddamn uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And there is so much growth in that. So I don't find, though, in the stuff that you write, that you're writing to encourage people to get to discomfort. I think you're giving people a path to solutions and you're marking out a way to get to an objective, you know, whether it's, it's better service or more sales or, you know, reaching goals, establishing good goals, stuff like that. Are we going to see more and more of the or is there a way to communicate to somebody that, hey, make yourself uncomfortable? Because 
I, I don't personally get that from your writing. Oh, I have. Uh, it just depends on what writing you look at. Okay. I mean, mo- mostly I do that weekly on my Sunday newsletter. Okay. I mean, that that's the the place where I tend to push, and I, I sometimes do it on the blog. But you're right. I mean, I I will tell you. You know, the the truth of the matter is in the second book, The Lost Start of Closing, mm-hmm. I have a chapter called Fearing the Wrong Danger. And it was specifically just a, a charge to tell people you have to go in and be extremely uncomfortable and have the conversations that you need to have, not the conversations that you want to have to serve your client. And, and it caused uh, a lot of consternation on the part of my publisher who said, I don't know if you should keep this chapter in the book, but I insisted on keeping it in the book because you do have to be uncomfortable. If you're going to grow, you have to be uncomfortable. You have to be uncomfortable with the idea. You have to be uncomfortable doing the work until it's comfortable. And then when it's comfortable, it's probably time for you to look at it and say, I should probably be looking for another way to be uncomfortable because that's where the growth comes from. But I, I've written um, as many, I would say, blog posts or newsletters for sure about the fact that you have to get uncomfortable and you have to go someplace you haven't been before if you want growth uh, as I have other content. I think it's a critical component to, you know, what, what I would call being more and then doing more and then having more and then contributing more in that order. That's a, that's a really powerful order. And I'll tell people hit that 15 second rewind button and listen to that again. How important is physical endurance in what you do for a living? I, I don't, I can't imagine it's not important for everyone. I mean, I, I think there's so much incoming now in the way of requests and uh, chimes on our phone that we're, we're being interrupted all the time. I think the ability to sustain your focus over time is critical. And I think that you do have to have a physical endurance that allows you to focus. And I think that it takes a lot of energy, more energy than people think. I've recommended now for um, many, many years that people focus on uh, three 90 minute blocks of concentrated work on their biggest priorities because 90 minutes, if you're really, really focused and you're really digging into the work, that's a long time. It's a long enough time that you can get something done. But three of those blocks, four and a half hours of real focused work a day, end up transforming people's results. And you do have to have a certain endurance to be able to do that. And it also takes a physical endurance, in my view, to even just focus on anything and say, I'm going to turn off all the distractions and I'm going to give myself over to something. And you were just talking about a writer. Uh, writing is certainly one of those endeavors where you you have to go into a different state and say, I'm giving all of my energy and all of my focus to this one thing. Uh, uh, Writing definitely does that for me. It's sort of a a flow state, but it's not something you can maintain for eight hours. It's something that you can maintain for an hour or an hour and a half. If you're really, really feeling good, maybe three hours. But that, I think, would be the end of anyone's duration in doing that kind of work. But it's critically important to have the physical endurance to, to focus and keep your clarity through all of that. And it's not bad for looking good in a suit. Um, but I also want to, if we go back to dedicating yourself 90 minutes at a time, you know, that is going to be a tall order for some people. Some people are going to have to ease into that, but let's give some examples of the three things that you might do over the course of a day where you're dedicating 90 minutes to something. And let's assume that you've already checked one box, which is writing. Yeah, that would probably be my first block. Okay. And I, I I just, I like to write in the morning, you know, I've already written probably this, it's 1048 AM here when we're talking and I have probably already written something like 2000 words this morning. Uh, morning. That's, that's just normal for me. So that's, that's what I tend to do. One more time, you've written 2,000 words, and it's 1030 in the morning on a Saturday. So writers out there, write. Just write. This is my my problem, too, is that, you know, I consider myself by definition a writer before, before everything else that I am. But I, I'm finding myself, when I, when I give myself my own report card, I'm not writing enough. 
So I just want to punctuate that point for my fellow writers in, in the uh, audience. It is 1030 in the morning and Anthony has written 2,000 words. Okay, <laughs> moving on. What are the other 90-minute things that you're going to do? Well, today is Saturday, but I'm a week away from my conference called Outbound. And uh, we do that every year in Atlanta at the end of April, probably be May next year. And uh, I'm going to end up having uh, an hour and a half meeting to go through uh, the show, uh, the run of show, and, and tighten all of that down and to make sure that it's what it's supposed to be. So I'll end up having a, a meeting where at the end of that meeting, we'll have a great uh, clarity on the run of show and we'll have all of the ideas uh, around how this is going to be a spectacular show for everyone already codified in a calendar and a schedule that makes sure that the event turns out the way it is. So that will be a focus block for me where there, there won't be a cell phone. There won't be any browser open. There will be a conversation where there's nothing else except for outbound for that 90 minutes, because that's what's necessary to do that kind of work. So that'll probably be my second one. Uh, the third focus block for me today, because it's Saturday, is the day that I deal with my inboxes. So I have a giant stack of mail and packages on my desk, and I'll go through all of those and scan them into Evernote and uh, process that. And then I'll go through five email inboxes and take all of them to zero and pull out all the tasks that I owe people. So that'll take me a good 90 minutes to get through that. And that's my every Saturday routine is to just get all of the inboxes cleared out down to zero so that tomorrow I can plan my week knowing that I have a view of all of my tasks and all of my meetings and all of the things that I owe people in one place. So that would be a third 90 minute block for me. And those two uh, last two might go in a different order. I might get the inbox cleared out before the outbound meeting, but we'll see. Okay. You know, these are things that seem like easy tasks that you would just do in between stuff, but it's important to stay focused on these things and important to get your things cleared off so that you can have a shift in focus and not have like a constant uh, worry that's just picking away at your brain uh, subconsciously. I think that one of the things that we can learn from, from you, aside from the stuff that you write, is just the discipline that you've had to that you've had to employ for your own success because as a speaker uh, as an author as an entrepreneur uh, you've done all of these things with a quiet nobility and I just want to salute you for that and I think it's one of the things that that I admire about you that Pete I know that Pete admires about you and I think that I can speak for a chunk of your audience, whether they know it or not, that that's sort of what allows us to get in line behind you and, and not have to hesitate about consuming your content and applying it to our lives. And, and uh, it's what continues to make you useful. Well, thank you for saying that. And I, I, I call that, I call a lot of what we should be doing just, it is quiet work. I mean, you're, you're doing the work when no one can see you doing the work, you know, you're, you're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Not enough of that in the world. So uh, thank you for sort of, I guess, propagating it in the rest of us. I want to make sure that people are aware of what you're doing as we get into the spring and summer and how they can connect with you on a deeper level than just reading thesalesblog.com, subscribing to your Sunday newsletter. Uh, what are you looking forward to in the spring and summer that we can, that we can look forward to with you? The spring is going to be uh, outbound, so we're we're very very close to that. This is it's a huge event. There's going to be a thousand people there. It's maybe the biggest uh, show we've done. It is the biggest show we've done with the biggest names in in our world showing up to join us on stage. So that's certainly going to consume uh, at least the rest of uh, spring. Uh, in the summer, a lot of work, a lot of speaking engagements, and the outlining of the next three books and the plan to go forward and produce all those. So the best way to connect with me is, of course, the newsletter, and that's the salesblog.com forward slash newsletter. And when you go there, we'll, we'll send you a, a welcome letter with all the other places that you can connect. So you can subscribe to the YouTube show, the podcast, uh, pick up the books, whatever makes sense. And I want our listeners to know that they can uh, register and they can uh, get all the information about Outbound at OutboundConference.com. 
Um, you have a number of speakers that are going to be there uh, with you who are thought leaders in the industry who are going to be inspiring. And uh, I'm scrolling through. If you go to outboundconference.com, you can see a list of speakers. You can register there on the site, uh, get some more information about the conference schedule and uh, even where to stay and plan your trip. As a centerpiece of your of your spring, by all means, go consume all the content. Wait a minute. Holy cow. I'm looking at the uh, website. Well, I'd love to give you a plug, but this thing is sold out. Um, it, it will probably switch that by the time you post okay. this. To, and to, this will be a funny thing for people to listen to, but we'll probably put a, a sign up for next year up very soon, you know, probably even uh, before the event starts. I mean, there's... There are people that are trying to get tickets now, but yeah, we did sell it out, which happens every well, year. Well, then let's make sure that our listeners know that this is uh, an expression of the value of this content. Uh, if you want to get better at sales, if you want to get better at sales leadership, if you want to improve your performance, your results, the feeling of reward that you get in serving your customers, because it's more than just improving the numbers. It's about improving yourself doing a better job, rewarding yourself uh, in the job that you do. All of these things are tied together. And all of these things are things that Anthony discusses at thesalesblog.com and on the Sunday newsletter. Uh, Anthony, thanks, man. Thank you for week after week, year after year. Uh, this is your, I believe, fourth appearance on the show. And it's different every time. It's new every time. Somehow you keep us going and you keep us going by keeping yourself going, and we appreciate it. Anthony Annarino, everybody. 